Hi, my name is Shonak. Um, I'm the director of All That Beats and um, very happy to be here. Welcome to the fourth season of Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin, London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week it is my supreme pleasure to welcome award-winning filmmaker Shaunak Sen, director of All That Breathes. The film premiered at Sundance earlier this year, where it won the Grand Jury Prize in the World Cinema Documentary Competition. It also picked up the Golden Eye Award at this year's Cannes Film Festival. All That Breathes follows two brothers who run a bird hospital dedicated to rescuing injured black kites, a staple in the smock-choked skies of New Delhi, where cows, rats, monkeys, frogs, and hogs struggle to survive amidst a worsening ecological as well as social environment. In the words of one of the Sundance jurors, this poetic film delivers an urgent political story while constructing a singular and loving portrait of protagonists resisting seemingly inevitable ecological disaster, with humorous touches punctuated by unsentimental depiction of the animal kingdom. It is no wonder, then, that All That Breathes is tipped to be in the running for an Oscar. Join me as we talk with Shaunak about his efforts to bring his beautifully artistic and socially relevant film to the big screen. Shaunak Sen, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Yeah, well, it's a, a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us here at Factual America. It's um, just to we've, listeners and viewers have uh, heard and seen the intro, but just to remind you, we're here with Shaunak Sen, director and producer of... Um, of All That Breathes, uh, premiered at Sundance, uh, won the Grand Jury Award, Golden Eye at Cannes, uh, also had a thea- is having a theatrical release in the UK this month, it's October 2022, so on the 14th, and I understand also a New York and LA releases later in October, and it's way far away, but I understand that you'll be... Um, it will be streaming on HBO sometime in 2023. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really looking forward to to, to talking to you about this uh, this lovely film, this beautiful film that you've made. Um, maybe you can uh, we can get started. You can because uh, most of our listeners will not have seen the film, I believe. So, maybe you tell us what is all that breathes all about. Maybe you can give us a synopsis. Well, it's about, at one very simple level, it's about this one bird called the Black Kite in the city of Delhi. Uh, and this family, uh, this Muslim family that looks after hundreds of black kites that are falling off the sky every single day. The um, current levels of pollution and a variety of other climate change related factors are such that the bigger birds in the city either get entangled in wires or get um, or collided to buildings and so on. Um, so at one level, it's about this one family that works out of this tiny, very claustrophobic, stifled kind of mm. basement and uh, takes care of, um, in the last 15 years, they've treated over 25,000 black guys. So that's one aspect of it. However, I mean, like I keep saying, it's not at all like a sweet film about nice people doing good things. Yeah. It's uh, a kind of philosophical non human relationships, you get a sense of the kind of social and political background of the city of Delhi. And in a way, we look at the toxicity of the air to also think of the, well, the toxicity on the ground between human beings and so on. So um, I think the best kind of logline of it is that it's a kind of philosophical examination of human non human relationships in an extreme ecosystem like the city of Delhi through this one family's relationship with this bird called the black kite. Mm. And I think, well, I, I, I think that is the perfect uh, synopsis of what this film's about. Have, uh, since I've had the pleasure of uh, of seeing it, um, I mean, what maybe give us a little more detail in terms of what these these brothers are up against, and also, I mean, you know, I, I, at one level, as you say, there's this ecological element and how it affects wildlife, but what affects wildlife is also affecting humans too. 
and it's not just mm-hmm. phys- physical health, is it? I mean, what is it? What's mm-hmm. it like to live in Delhi? And 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 you know, what are the pressures and and everything that these people are are going through? Well, the thing is that uh, I think in a way, this film um, it's only intuitively natural that this film came from somebody in Delhi. Um, I've lived in Delhi for the last many years, and for anybody who's lived um, in that city, your life is sort of constantly laminated by a pervasive grayness. You know, the sky is a kind of monochromatic, hazy, gray expanse. You're constantly breathing in air that's very obviously noxious. And the air itself is a kind of heavy, palpable, concrete kind of a entity. And um, the film also began with this one time when me and my uh, producer and friend Aman Man were um, sat in a car in a traffic jam. And we looked up and, you know, the black kites are these tiny black dots gliding in the sky. And we had the distinct impression that one of them was sort of falling down to the ground. And I was gripped by this figure of a bird that falls off a very polluted gray sky. Mm -hmm. And what happens to it? So we started researching into what happens to, I mean, I literally Googled what happens to birds that fall off the sky. And I came across these uh, brothers and the remarkable work that they do where, you know, they're working out of a very tiny derelict kind of a industrial basement on one side of which there's this heavy metal cutting machines. And on the other, you have these magisterial birds being treated. So it was just so inherently cinematic that that's how it started. But living in Delhi really is this, you really feel like, and when I met the brothers, I realized that they sort of have the front row seats to the apocalypse. But more than that, it's like um, everywhere. If you live in the city of Delhi, you're conscious, you're constantly conscious of what you're breathing in. And as if the air conditioners of spaceship Earth are beginning to go awry. So that's the broader sensation. Yeah. And why do these, I mean, as you say, these the, what these brothers are up against, what, I mean, what, what drives them? Their life is not easy, you know, but they're they're basically self-taught veterinarians. You know, they've they're they do amazing, as you said, they've treated what twenty thousand, over twenty thousand birds over fifteen years or so. I mean, they they've got other things. They're obviously intelligent. They could maybe do you know what 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 drives them to carry on with this. Um, yes, I mean, I don't think that intelligence is a kind of um, binary opposite to what they do. Uh, the, oh, no, I don't mean uh, it that way. Yeah. Uh, and like all difficult questions, I don't think there's any simple answer. So the brothers themselves don't have any answer to give for it. And I don't think it's possible for them to know. Because now at this point, the entirety of their lives and their family, and what they do is entirely singularly devoted to the cause of working with the birds. But more than that, I think um, what I was drawn was that a lot of the environmental discourse, especially in cinema and popular culture, I sort of sometimes get a bit tired with because a lot of it is characterized by a kind of either a bleeding heart sentimentality or a kind of gloom and doom despair, you know. Mm. Instead, I think you have to sort of emotionally move people. And the brothers were refreshing to me because they're kind of, is of a kind of wry resilience. They put their head down and get the job done. And they're very unsentimental and often stoic. So even though they have, like I was saying, this front row seat to the apocalypse, they have this kind of a, you know, they, they're unsentimental and they're, the birds are falling and the entirety of the bird fall of Delhi comes into their tiny basement, but they get on with it. And that kind of a, a cruel optimism or a kind of elegant um, stoicness to the obvious inevitability of, to the disaster that is coming, I find very, very interesting as a kind of emotional and philosophical position. So that's how I first got drawn to them. Hmm. And then at the same time, you've alluded to this that uh, when you were talking about toxicity, but uh, there's also this backdrop of... Uh, political turmoil and social violence, which I gather you, I mean, that's, you were already filming when some of these things happened, uh, that started happening, weren't you? So you weren't necessarily expecting to, to capture these things, but they are there and they're, they're, I wouldn't say upfront and center, but they're, they're part of the, they're, 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 they're part of the story, obviously. Sure, sure. Um, well, they're definitely not uh, front and center. And I think, Initially, uh, we had begun 
um, with the express intention of making an ecological film, and uh, well, you know, not a kind of frontally conventionally political film. And um, I think over time, what happened is that the city of Delhi was going through a lot of turbulence and tumult in the last um, two years. And they um, uh, basically, it was at one point I didn't want to eschew entirely the um, uh, volatility of the streets outside, but at the same time, the brothers themselves are not very um, polit. I mean, I think they're political in a different way. They're interested in the politics of man and humans, uh, mm. humans and birth. But uh, that's a different uh, kind of uh, politics, you know, not the politics of identity or sectarian violence and so on. Right. So, um, um, but you know, in the background of the um, city was just so pregnant with this kind of um, um, unruly uh, chaos that, uh, and unrest that uh, it had to make its way in. And the form that we sort of zeroed in on was of the leak that a character goes to the balcony and you hear the murmurations of a protesting crowd outside. A character goes to um, watches a video of violence uh, on his cell phone and we just hear the audio and nothing else. Mm. Mm. You know, it's like, so it's basically stuff like that. It's um, um, where the real outside world sort of hemorrhages in. So you sense the political instead of being told. And I actually, in hindsight, prefer this sort of a thing where, because I personally feel like if somebody pedantically kind of lectures you on what yeah. a certain political subject stands, you're either preaching to the choir or you're any way sort of, um, you know, like not talking to the people that you want to talk to. The point is the films have to be Trojan horses and you have to sneak things in and you yeah. have to get people to be moved emotionally and still understand the political uh, stuff that, you know, is happening. So it's really about sensing the political through the aesthetic. Right, right. And I mean, I think like you, like you said, I think there's one one of the brothers at one point says that's, you know, this is happening about a kilometer away, right? Or, or two kilometers yeah, away, yeah. I think he says, you know, and right, it's like, right. um, which is kind of, Maybe that's a, not to take this too far, but maybe in terms of uh, sort of analogies. I mean, for most people, isn't it always just? It's always it, it, seldom are we in the middle of it all. In a lot of times, it's often it is just the street over, the the neighborhood over, the country. You know, it, it's 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 kind of we are surrounded by this, but we're not necessarily. Um, you know, it's, 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 it may be directly, you know, directly involved that, you know, in terms of the person trying to view this and, and yeah, I, connection. Uh, I think, sorry, sorry, go, go on, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Question. No, I was just saying that I think there are different ways in which one can find entry points into a broader zeitgeist and one that is as um, tempestuous as what's happening in South Asia currently. Um, and I think in uh, there are different ways, you know, you can, adopt a more oblique or tangential kind of a perspective, which also illuminates the particular social thread that you're interested in certain ways, or you can take it on more frontally. I personally prefer the more oblique kind of mm. style. And of course, things are happening like three kilometers away and it's like you're feeling there's a kind of neighborliness to all things political um, and uh, volatile. It's never as far as you think it is. But uh, kind of uh, entering it through this kind of a, a perspective of somebody who's um, not directly confronting it or uh, is in the thick of it, but is affected by it and is uh, at the same time conscious of it. And the city is on the boil behind it. I mm. find that, when, that a kind of interesting um, mm. way to snapshot a, a social milieu. Mm. Okay. I think, well, I think that's a very good po point. And I think this is actually a very good opportunity for us to give our listeners a quick um, early break. So we'll be right back with uh, Sean Sen, director and producer of All That Breathes, premiered at Sundance in earlier this year, won the Grand Jury Award, won the Golden Eye at Can the Cannes Film Festival. It's having its theatrical release in the UK on October 14th, and then later this month in New York and L.A., and at some point in 2023, you'll be streaming on HBO. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. 
Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning director Sean Sen. His film is All That Breathes, uh, premiered at Sundance. It's having its theatrical release in the UK in a few days here in October 2022, uh, and in New York and LA later this month. Um, you did win the uh, did win the Golden Eye Award at Cannes, and it goes. Uh, there's a quote from the jury. It says, "Goes to a film that, in a world of destruction, reminds us that every life matters, and every small action matters. You can grab your camera, you can save a bird, you can hunt for some moments of stealing beauty. It matters. It's an inspirational journey and in the observation of three Don Quixotes who may not save the world, but do save their world. What do you think of quotes like that?" I love that quote. I love the term Don Quixote. I also love the um, emphasis on micro gestures because at the end of the day, what's, you know, like I was earlier talking about the philosophical position towards climate change that I think the brothers embody. Mm-hmm. Uh, this thing that when you talk to them, they'll say that every every bird that flies out of their basement is a miracle. And it's really true. I mean, those, you know, it's like, they're, they've done what they've done almost without any support for the last many, many years. Mm. They're, um, um, they're definitely not an affluent family by any stretch. Yeah. So for them to carry on, so, like to soldier on and do what they're doing, um, it really matters in the sense that the fact that uh, a certain percentage of birds survive and uh, many of them fly off. Um, of course, if one sort of zooms out and says that in the broader scheme of things, what does it matter if a hundred birds survived in a month where 5,000 birds died or, you know, I mean, these are hypothetical yeah. numbers. Yeah. I'm just yeah. speaking hypothetically. But the point is that I think it matters like micro gestures and micro act need certain things to be life rafts to get by. Um, you know, life is difficult. It's difficult because of climate change. It's difficult because the world is hostile and it's difficult emotionally. So, a kind of, um, you know, it's important to think of uh, the passage of time and the meaning of life in um, micro dosages. And in that, what they do is that they provide, like to me, I see them as tiny paper boats or life rafts. Of And I feel like it really matters. And the film is a kind of um, articulation of that, Thing. Hmm. And did you ever expect to get such a reaction to your film? I mean, in your wildest imaginations, because it's it's obviously done quite well. I mean, in the in my wildest imaginations, um, I I thought I hoped that it would be uh, successful. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. if one was to think imaginatively wildly, but hmm. no, I think this went beyond that because I was hoping for the film to be seen. That was my main sort of. Hmm desire and ambition but this has now gone far beyond uh, my desire matrix or anything that i'd imagine yeah. uh, because uh, winning at uh, sundance and can what it does is that more than anything else it's not so much a question about me being happy about success it's more a question about the fact that the film now enters conversations and enters rooms that i just didn't think it would right. so it becomes part of a constituency that far outreaches what any of us had imagined yeah and do you think, I mean, do you think that's basically any filmmakers, really, when it comes down to it, you just want people to see it. You're not thinking beyond that, really, when you, when yes, you make a I film. Yes, I think that's the starting point. No, I think that's the founding point, for sure. You really want to see it, and especially because I'd made a film before this that uh, had gone to a few festivals, but didn't really get uh, anywhere close to the kind of wide enough viewership that uh, we were all hoping for. So uh, just seeing it, it was enough currency for me. But above and beyond, of course, you also want people to like it. or And not so much, like, it's not so much liking, but for it to um, spark off some kind of conversation. And, right. Uh, right. you know, and if people are going beyond that, like it, and, uh, you know, like, at least like yesterday in the uh, New York Film Festival, we had a really... Uh, emphatic response and that was very meaningful you mm. know so those kinds of things really matter and what was that response yes that you had yesterday you know you have a lot of people somebody wrote on a piece of paper uh, saying that you can use the coenzymes of the birds poops to uh, help generate food for them 
and it is said that uh, i gathered that this is a person who's a scientist or a researcher right. of some sort so from that to extremely emotionally um overwhelmed reactions or or to you know yeah. like um cooler kind of um uh evaluations of the films aesthetic and formal strategies or you know yeah. like it is a reception yeah. afterwards and it's like it feels like there's a kind of celebration of the world of the brothers and a very serious mm. engagement with the film's grammar uh and that that's all you can ask for what else like mm. you know it's not like we've made a kind of box office uh, <laughs> uh you know it's not like we're yeah. you're expecting that kind of thing. so this is the really the um uh, end of what we were looking for in terms of response so that that's this is totally fine I mean, you you were saying earlier that uh, literally this is down to sitting in the car, looking up in the uh, in the gray skies and seeing the kites and thinking you're seeing one falling and uh, or did see one fall and then you looked looked this up. I mean, how did this? I mean, how did this film come about? Did you it, literally you did a Google and then you found Muhammad and Nadim and then uh, you went and approached them and is that that basically the the genesis of this? Yes, very much. I we literally googled where do birds that follow the sky go, and then we um, found them. And once, see, a film is anyway like a free fall, right? Like, and it takes time and it takes uh, effort, uh, and you don't know where it's going to land. So, it was that kind of an amorphous, shape shifting kind of a free fall, and mm-hmm. we vaguely knew that we wanted to work on the triangulation of air, birds, and people. Mm-hmm. and afterwards the it takes on a kind of momentum of its own we didn't anticipate the social political threats to happen we didn't anticipate one of the brothers going off uh, to the us all the uh, emotional kind of tensions between the brothers themselves and none of that it, in the film like this also the animals themselves are always deliciously disregard full of your designs right so there's nothing that you can really plan beforehand and um in think the um aggressive embrace of the unscriptedness of the world yeah yeah and that's uh, i mean that's that's well it's it's what verite fly on the wall stuff is isn't it you never know really what you're going to get at any any one time um do you I mean, did you when you first? I mean, did you know instantly that those brothers were going to work as subjects? Because you could have, they could be doing wonderful work, but not work as subjects, right? Or wouldn't? Yeah, make, yeah. Know. So, incidentally, the uh, the first ever set of characters that we met for the film were um, the brothers. So, actually, yeah. I've never ever researched beyond the brothers for this film. So, we met the brothers on the thirty first of December, twenty eighteen, mm-hmm. uh, on New Year's uh, Eve, and. Yeah. Uh, within a week from that we started the film with them we never met other characters no other research beyond these people so that's how it began i was certain i did not want to be a fly on the wall i don't think the film is really the classic frederick wiseman kind of observation no. fly on the wall yeah. sort of thing yeah nor is it i mean you know hudzog says that he's not a one uh, hudzog says that he's not so much a, a fly on the wall but a be that stings because he has that kind right. of a strong right. intervention sort of thing i don't think we're anyway anywhere uh, if we are neither the fly nor the um, bee i think we're more like uh, earthworms um, wriggling sideways in the middle of yeah. that sex spectrum well i think that brings me up to an interesting point well i th- i found interesting uh because it isn't really uh, as you say it's not really flying the wall because there's a lot of things like I, I well I guess what I'm getting to is uh the the cinematography and uh you had three cinematographers was that was that the plan that's not usual for uh, I'm not for sure. uh, yeah yeah that's not usual nor was it planned uh I'd be, I'd be a total mad person to uh plan with three different DPs but what mm-hmm. essentially happened is that people hey, look we shot for two and a half three years those are long periods of time and yeah. it's very difficult to get one person to you know Uh, stay it through so the two dps are uh, this german dp called ben bernhard and the indian dp riju das who um, it's with, it's with ben that we developed this kind of vocabulary of the long languid uh, pants mm. and 
right. breakdowns and focus shifts and so on, where you know you see the natural world in this kind of uncut, uninterrupted, slow, flowy sense. And it's with him that we develop this kind of a poetic lyrical style, and also this poetic style of not just shooting animals, but also this poetic style of shooting the human beings. Um, mm. So it's with him that we developed it, and then that it ev- evolved further with uh, uh, Raju. Where we were, as you know, in the film, there's a panoply of animals like uh, kite, uh, rats, snails, right. horses, pigs, um, and uh, all of those have also been shot in this. The idea was to shoot it not like a regular nature doc or a wildlife doc, but right. make it cinematic. Yeah. And um, uh, we were with that kind of, uh, you know, we took our time. We wanted to shoot it like a proper high art. film and not like a wildlife talk so mm. uh, we committed ourselves to the visual grammar of it yeah no i think it's a very good point because it's not you know it's not your typical animal planner even i mean you know people like even david attenborough docs go for some they are increasingly or have, for a long time try to go for something what they would call artistic but it's nothing like what they would present is it i mean it's it's very uh i i'm just that first scene um just personally i i who got to who got the short straw and had to sit down and get down and dirty with the rats at the beginning you know to uh to film all that i mean that's uh but it's it's very uh it's very poignant you've got a, f- a lot of you've got a, a several uh, scenes interspersed with those kind of moments i feel like um uh, all of us wanted the short straw because all when you're shooting <laughs> animals and anything can happen yeah. you're all trying to like you know get uh, your piece of the adventures shot by yeah. so uh, that the opening rat shot which is like a 4 minute long shot where the camera just glides through uh, yeah. uh, hundreds of rats uh, with the traffic and the city in the background um yeah, that was was shot over like many hours through nights and uh, uh, you know of course at the end of it like rats were scurrying on top of our legs and all that but you sort of like you know shooting mode is a different kind of uh, your it's like a fever dream of uh, where you're driven by different kinds of uh, um you know you're not your usual self there's a kind of transformative potential of when mm-hmm. the shooting period begins where you're truly adventurous and your entire body and everything is in service of something quote and quote greater mm-hmm. um but yeah those are intense times but you know like uh, a film like this requires tons and tons of wrecking and wrecking and wrecking and because you're shooting animals but once you get a hang of it it's really um addictive shooting animals mm. and i mean normally I don't ask questions like this and probably filmmakers hate these kind of questions but i mean who i mean who are your insp- who are your inspirations because i feel like you know yeah there've been artistic docs obviously but uh but it it felt like this was going more for classic uh uh narratives you know in terms of a lot of the way the th- things were shot and filmed and and even the uh even the sound you know i i think it's uh was that w- w- did you have anything did, were you did you have any specific references in mind when you were d- making this film or 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 filming or is it just kind of you had a you all had a vision for how you kind of saw this and you did your did what I, you could to in you know c- capture that i think um references not so much in terms of i want to make a film which uh plots its uh narrative structure out in such and such way but mm-hmm. more in the sense of um an aesthetic loosely defined universe that was the filmography that we were looking mm-hmm. at and um i'm actually I wonder like why you think that filmmakers don't want to because I love speaking about my mm. heroes and references and mm. all of that and I mean so much of filmmaking is an inherently citational act mm. and that's the beauty of it you know it's all very incestuous and it ought to be so um I love talking about like people who've uh, been important to me for instance in this film um I I think three people are worth mentioning for uh one is that cinematographically i was very interested in the camera style of uh, you know the filmmaker called viktor kosakovsky who made yes. aquarella and 
yeah uh, antipodas and so on and actually ben our german dp shoots a lot of viktor kosakovsky's films so he okay. shot aquarella and so on and okay. um he uh, like i sort of reached out to him because i wanted to you know dip my toes in that holy kernel of uh, cinematographic practice and that's mm-hmm. how it began then so i can't recommend enough a film called vivanla antipodas which is an incredible and to my mind i'm going to completely fanboy on this now the best short documentary that i've seen wow and what was that then called again antipodas vivan las antipodas okay Vic, right. by victor kosakos the um second um i was also very inspired by editing was as i think by this person called gianfranco rossi um and i loved the editing style of films like sakurji are or nutano and so on um and similar to that was of uh, this film called truffle hunters that had come out and in fact mm. our editor shandit bengson was also the editor of truffle hunters so the structural oh, right? logic of that film was very interesting because it's not a regular linear kind of a story and right. that's also something that i was very drawn to Hmm. and lastly i i'm interested in this kind of hybrid form that a film director like roberto minervini does hmm. which is sort of like it has the outer container of a being a documentary but it takes in uses the toys of fiction to tell something that is very grounded in the real and empirical world so that's very interesting to me as well okay well and i and i and appreciate that and i stand corrected i will ask more of our filmmakers their uh their inspirations uh, for their films. I mean, a lot of people, uh, I've seen some reviewers have really, and I, I second this, um, also highlight uh, the score and the music and this, this, the sound work. That, and did, uh, how did, uh, is, is his name Roger Gula that uh, yeah. got involved? Roger Gula is a, a composer based in London. And my, our main sort of thing was that firstly, we wanted to have a surprising kind of choice of music, so not too much strings. but it, i thought it had to be like a kind of fairy tale at first where when we were talking about the brothers um kind of uh, ravenous relationship with the kite and it had to emerge as this kind of a childhood fairy tale aura thing of the kite was a wondrous otherworldly magical being but at the same time it had to eventually progress into a fairy tale gone dark so we used a lot of distortion and in the distortion we used a lot of diegetic sounds of the kites and talons and feathers and so on so that was largely how we were thinking yeah no it's uh, well it's it all comes to together so well and it's so 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 beautifully done um i mean you're relative this is only your second feature um if i believe uh if i believe wikipedia you're doing a you're still a student in a way you're well we're all students i guess but you're a phd student i no, think no um Are, is that no, wrong uh, no it's wrong it's really infuriating and I, it's like i can't i can't seem to figure uh, how to edit wikipedia <laughs> because i finished my phd two years ago okay. and everybody comes up to me and you know the, the the difference between somebody who's doing a phd and somebody who's done with a phd is truly truly it's incomparable in the life so I am very much firmly and happily in the post PhD life, and I want to um, announce that uh, unambiguously. Um, so no, I'm done. I'm, I've been done with the PhD for a while, and uh, yeah, and of course that was like profoundly impactful in terms of thinking of the film and so on. So, um, uh, but just to clarify, I'm, I'm done. Okay, so now that you're done, uh, what is? I mean, what is next for you? How are you going to how are you going to top this? Well, I don't I'm not going to say how are you going to top this. What are you going to do next? Um in terms of I think I'm interested in uh, I think I'm interested in the world of the planetary still and I think the main wheelhouse of things that I'd stay in would be the ecological sublime. But above and beyond that I don't know yet. Maybe fiction is the form, but um something to do with issues of and I want to zoom out further and um and think through a kind of geological lens but largely the ecological sublime the planetary you know continent shifting mm. uh, but you'll only get these kinds of vague platitudes from me right now because i'm still marinating in things that i'm reading and i don't know what to do next yeah but okay i think that's uh i mean that's a um that's i i can appreciate that and you're probably still just enjoying what uh 
what all that breathes is is bringing your way uh, 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 for the moment. But I think, I mean, as you were saying, you stick with the planetary. I mean, uh, and I, I really, what struck with me, what resonated with me was your comments earlier about this sort of dichotomy. Either people tend to go sort of um, over-sentimentalized or... Or yeah, that's not the word you used, but you used a better word than I am coming up with now. Or you have your doom and gloom uh, merchants when it comes to these sort of things. I mean, are you? Ho- I mean, but personally, are you hopeful? Do you think? I mean, you're see you you you've lived in Delhi. You see you've you've obviously a, a citizen of the world. You see what's happening. I mean, what did, do you? Uh, are you a hopeful person about what's going to happen with with our? with our environment um i I think it's um there's it's impossible to have any kind of simple-minded um hope that is vanilla and milk toast um all hope of course has to be tempered by so i have a kind of guarded um cautious um optimism um let's call it optimism instead of hope um in the sense that because optimism is also a kind of agential uh, position on the world so um, but I also what else is there to do right like you have to uh, mm. what what, are, what is the counter side to it um, so you are obviously very aware of what increasingly feels like the inevitability of um, something genuinely um, dark that is um, uh, that seems to be in the offing but um, uh, yeah I think I'm I'm hopeful I'm uh, I'm uh, micro hopeful in uh, the language of um, the brother's life which is right. these kind of smaller micro gestures that help so i'm i'm i i feel that these kinds of individual uh, things where everybody's mounting the ramparts in their own um, individual capacity is very important okay thanks well i think we'll uh I think we'll leave it at that with leaving you the last word. I, 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 I um, want to thank you again so much, uh, Shaunak, for uh, coming onto the podcast and uh, discussing your, your lovely film. Uh, and I do encourage everyone to, if, as, as soon as possible, however you can find it, uh, to go out and, uh, and see this film. It's, uh, again, to remind you, we've been here with Shaunak Sen, director and producer of All That Breathes, premiered at Sundance, it's having its theatrical release here in the UK uh, on October 14th, also releasing in theaters in New York and L.A. at the end of the month. And for those of you who can't get to any of those theaters or cinemas, do um, well, hopefully you don't have to wait till 2023, but it will be streaming on HBO. So, uh, Shanak, again, thank you so much. Uh, we'd love to have you back on when you you do your next max masterpiece. So, uh, sure. um, hopefully that's not thank too you. far in the, very, in the future. Thank you. This is very enjoyable. Um, and uh, thank you for having me on. Well, thank you. And thanks for everyone who helped make, make it happen. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com, and clicking on the Get In Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.